Thank you, thank you, Stefano. Uh, and thank you for coming for having me here. So yeah, I'm going to talk about a few um, uh, problems that we are working on, or projects that we are working on at DeepMind Health Research, which is the the group that I am in. So the first um, the first project is on segmentation of uh, organs at risk for uh, planning re re planning radiotherapy. The second one is on uh, um, having models that infer the referral of eye scans, as we have here. And then the last one is on uh, how to deal with ambiguity uh, when it comes to segment organs or whatever, actually. So the first two projects are, are more applied. They, they, are, they have a specific application, and the point eventually is to deploy them in, in, the, real, in the real world, in, in, in hospitals. The first one is in collaboration with the UCL hospital, and the second one is in collaboration with the Moorfield High Hospital. Whereas the last one is, is more like a, a broad project, is, is applicable, uh, is more abstract and it's applicable to, to all these projects. Uh, by the way, um, feel free to ask me any question at, at, at any point, just feel free to, to interrupt me. So let's start with the first project, it's uh, on segmentation of organs. So here the thing is that um, we are, when doctors and, uh, plan uh, the radiotherapy, uh, when they, what they have to do, first of all, is to segment the tumor, but also the organs around the tumor, because the point is to maximize the dose on the, on the tumor area and as, at the same time as minimizing the, the, the damage made on, on the organs. So uh, just to give you a, a bit of a hint of, about what happens, um, so when, when a patient is diagnosed with cancer and, and doctors uh, um, I think that the radiotherapy is the way to go. What, what they do is to, ha to do a CT on the, on the patient, um, a CT scan. Uh, then there is a, a, a radiographer segments uh, organs and the tumor. Uh, then this segmentation is, is signed off by an oncologist. Oncologists may uh, usually provide or may provide feedback to the radiographer to fix some things. So there is a loop over there between the radiographer and the, and the oncologist. And eventually, whenever they are happy with the segmentations, then they, they send those to a, a software uh, that optimizes uh, the, how to place the beams for the, for the radiotherapy uh, in order to, uh, yeah, to maximize the, the radio applied to the tumor. So usually, uh, this process here takes, for a, for a radiographer and an oncologist, uh, usually takes uh, around four hours. Um, but given that they also have many other things to do and they have also many, many patients, usually what it takes for a patient to go from this stage to there is around uh, four to six weeks. So the main purpose of uh, our project here was to, to reduce this, to, to, to make this time shorter. In particular, uh, we focus here uh, on segmenting 21 organs as, at risk uh, on neck and, her and head cancer, which are like the ones that you see over there, brain, uh, m many others. Um, and to do, the, to do this in a way that we can um, make the life of, uh, of the radiographer easier and, and more efficient, so that in total uh, it requires, we decide to have a, a top of one hour um, for, for the radiographer to have the whole, the whole thing done. So um, this is the, the organs that we have uh, been considering, and also this is the, the label slices. So as you can see, the CT scans are 3D volumes. Um, well, uh, and then here we see a reconstruction of, uh, of different classes. Um, so at the, um, for, for collecting those, we got a lot of data from the UCLH hospital, but also we had um, we hired um, radiographer, radiographers to, to label uh, some of the um, organs uh, in, inside the mine. So we were collecting many, many of those labels, and, and this is the number of slices that, that are re uh, where these uh, organs appear. So yeah, in total, we have over 150,000 slices. Um, so yeah, the, of course, there is a, a convolutional neural network to work, to work on this. So given that we are interested in, in doing segmentation, we have uh, this so-called unit, which is, um, yeah, takes as an input a set of slices. So in this case, 21 by 5, 12 by 5, 12. And then you have a, uh, an analysis path here that 
gets features of uh, more uh, of uh, more global features as, as you get down here, and then you have a synthesis path that uh, yeah, just go back to the original size of the of the input image and generates um, the the segment the output uh, which is the segmentation that we are interested in. And then we have these skip connections that are really useful to go from directly transmit information from the analysis path to the synthesis path. So um, one thing to, to keep in mind here is that um, due to, uh, among other things, due to memory constraints, we cannot, we cannot uh, have the whole uh, volume, the whole CD scan as an input, and have the whole CD scan as an output, because you have to keep it, you have to get along the process a lot of activations in memory so that you can backpropagate them in the, in the backpropagation side of the, of the, of, of the training uh, uh, process. So in practice, what we do is exactly just consider um, a small, um, well, in this case, 21 slices instead of the whole set of slices that I think it was actually 136. Uh, and then we only produce as an output one slice, which is the, the, the prediction of the, center, of the central slice that we have there. And this is done because we have uh, these, um, we have uh, convolutions in the in the set dimension, like in the in the slice dimension. So we have ten of them, so that they, they keep reducing the uh, the context. Uh, well, they um, keep reducing the size of the of the features uh, in the in that dimension. So basically, at training time, we have twenty one slices in and one out, which is the prediction for the central one. <coughs> at inference time, we can have uh, as many as we as we are able to fit in the in the GPU. Uh, and then have uh, n plus 20 input as an input and then n as an output. Um, and yeah, usually we are, in inference we are able to fit more because then we don't need to keep the activations all along the, the network because we are not uh, training. So we are able to fit more, but still is, um, we, are, is, 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 we are not able to fit the whole, the whole city. So we, we have to do this, to do this uh, part wise. Um, okay, so how do we evaluate these models? Um, so we have as a ground truth, as a gold standard, uh, exactly the, the process that uh, that the medical doctors do to, to get the, the labels, which is this uh, loop that I described before, in which the radiographer and, and the oncologist have to agree. And then we compare uh, against this uh, ground truth, we compare our model and how one radiographer could do on, it, on its own, on, on his or her own. Uh, these are some qualitative results that uh, we present here. So here the field uh, regions are ground truth, gold standard, whereas the contours are the, um, the predictions made by, the, by our model, the unit, and by the uh, radiographer, which is, by the way, an independent radiographer, it's not the one in the loop. So we can see here that the predictions look pretty, pretty good in general, but there are, of course, some, some errors. And also we can see that usually the errors that are made by, by the radio affairs are quite similar to the errors that are made by the unit. So that's um, sort of interesting. So this is for the eye region. We have also similar things for the mouth region. And again, yeah. So did you consider using a discriminative network? And what made you choose? I just, I just So, how, how, I mean, this is, in a way, this is the simplest approach. It's just discriminative. You have an input, you have an output, you want to map, you have to have a model that maps the input to the classes. Uh, there are many ways in which you can model, uh, yeah, for example, you can, you can employ GANs or, or you, in many different ways. This is just the simplest. But do you have any way, is, do you have any specific um, uh, way of, uh, or in mind, you have, uh, well, I'm envisioning, I mean, you have your, your generated images, your regenerated images, which have the, the analysis, and then you have examples of the radiologist. You could have a discriminator network that could help train your network to be closer to radiologists. That, that, that's... Maybe, maybe you didn't have enough training data to do that. Uh, well, that, that, it, it could be an option. The thing is, here we, so I think what you are saying is, um, uh, so we have as an input, um, so we have as an input these uh, CD scans, and then you have as, as an output the, the segmentations. Right now, we are using a, a, spe a pre specified loss function. In this case, it's sigmoid uh, cross, uh, cross entropy. Um, but 
yeah, we could also have um, a discriminator in, uh, instead of a loss function so that you learn the, the loss. But we keep it simple. But, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's, that, that could be an option. Um, so yeah, similar results here. Um, and this is, uh, these are just some, uh, well, this is the, the results uh, of applying our model on uh, an open source test set that is, yeah, is, it is available. It's composed on, uh, of uh, 24 patients, uh, and yeah, again, it's the 21, the 21 organs. And in general, we see that um, it performs really well, uh, comparable to the to the um, uh, radiographer for for most organs. In actually, for 19 out of the 22, uh, 21 organs, it performs uh, at the same level of uh, of significance. Uh, but uh, in two of them, it, it, uh, it's uh, significantly worse. And yeah, we have some hypotheses. Usually these organs are, are smaller and, and more difficult to spot, but we're working on, on this. Um, and in terms of uh, patients, so as I said, we had four, uh, 24 patients, and in general, uh, we aggregate uh, the performance over organs that, that, are, um, that are relevant for, the, for that patient. And in general, we see that um, the, the performance is quite similar. It's uh, um, not significantly worse uh, than, than the radiographer performance. So yeah, in general, we're quite happy with, with the results. And so this progress so far is, is, is being reported in, in this paper in archive. Uh, so you can have a look there if you want uh, more details or also ask me. Um, but yeah, about the conclusions of this project, uh, so so far we have able to achieve similar uh, performance to radi radiographers in uh, uh, 19 out of 21 organs and, and on, in all patients in the test set. Uh, we have this double grading uh, to assess the human performance, um, this uh, way to get the ground truth. And then we have also um, made it public the open source segmentations of, on the, of the, of the uh, test set that we are using, uh, and also we are um, we, we have also another repo for the metrics that we were using in this, in this uh, project. And yeah, as I said, more details in the, in the archive paper. So I'm going to go through the next project, uh, but do you have any questions so far? Okay. Maybe I missed it, but uh, the metric, the surface PSA, is that did you? Uh, good question. So I I left it to <laughs> okay. Let me let me just look. You see, for the sake of time, I left it out. But actually, it could be interesting to briefly talk about this. Uh, hmm. I'm not sure how can I access the. So okay, uh, briefly speaking, um, the DS, the uh, dive surface metric. Where the thing is, what we wanted to to me to measure is is how much. Um, how long does it take for a ra radiographer to um, correct the, the segmentations that are provided by the model? So if we use, if we use uh, standard I intersection over union or dice course, the thing about this is that um, if the model predicts perfect, if the model makes a prediction of an organ, uh, of the, cent the center of the organ, but it, it does very badly in the, in the borders, uh, this is as bad for the radiographer as, as not predicting it at all, because at the end you, uh, the radiographer has to go through the whole contour. So the um, the surface dice score is, is a modification uh, on, on the original dice score, in, and basically I, I can tell you more details later if you are interested. But it, the the main the intuition is that uh, all that we care about this is about the intersection between the the surfaces with with some with some range with some threshold. So yeah, maybe I can go back to this. So um, yeah, so this is the oops, the uh, second um, the second project is on uh, on OCTs on eye scan uh, predictions of uh, diseases, um, and this well this has been recently published in Nature Medicine, and it's a, yeah as I said it's a joint project with with Murphy Hospital. So um, the, the main point of this is we have also 3D scans of the eye. I will uh, explain a bit more about how the scans look like. But the main point is to, 
to classify those scans among uh, how urgent uh, they should be treated. So um, these scans are OCD scans, optical coherent tomography. The, the main thing about them is that uh, they create, they um, allow you to have a 3D highly high resolution of, of the of the retina, and uh, the main principle is that uh, that is uh, that this is based on is, is basically like uh, ultrasounds, like, but but instead of uh, sounds you have you do use light sort of. Uh, in any in any case, what you get is something like this. Uh, so yeah, basically the the eye is looking upwards. And this is your retina. Well, uh, yeah, this is, these are layers of, of, the, of the back of your eye. So usually scans are of this shape, this uh, volume. So you have, uh, yeah, almost 90 uh, pixels times uh, 512 uh, times 112 slices. And I say usually because different uh, branches of uh, scan scanners have different resolutions, but that's quite common. So, um, as I said, uh, the point, of, the main point, or the main use case of this project is to uh, to be able to classify these um, these uh, scans in terms of whether they are urgent, so that the patient needs to be treated in terms of days, uh, semi-urgent in terms of weeks, routine, which is in months, and observation only, which is uh, the eye is completely healthy. So, uh, our pipeline. Uh, the model, the, the approach that we that we use here is, is a two-stage approach. So we have uh, the OCT as an input, and then in the, in the first stage we have a, a segmentation network as we had before for the radiography plan, uh, radiography project. Uh, in this case, actually we have several of them. So we have an ensemble of, of uh, segmentation models. So we have several outputs given the input. And then uh, in the second stage, we have uh, a classification uh, network, actually a, classi a classification ensemble. So again, you have several classifiers that get <coughs> uh, segmentations as an input, and then you get as an output the classification. So uh, training time for the first stage, we have uh, almost 900 uh, label slices. So in this case, uh, it's just, it, I'm not talking about whole scans, I'm just talking about uh, slices. Um, and then uh, for the second part of the um, of the of the approach, we have um, almost uh, fifteen thousand um, scans labeled according to uh, the referral, like agent, semi agent, and so on. So one question is that is like, given that we are interested in mapping from the original OCD scan to the to the referral. Why, why do we go into the into all this into into the pain on having two two stages and having the segmentation? So we have uh, two reasons for this. Uh, the, the first one is that uh, having a segmentation in the in the middle uh, allows us allows the model to be clinically interpretable. So uh, um, uh, clinicians can see uh, or can have a, a, um, some interpretation, some, uh, some knowledge about why the model decides that the input is uh, classified as, as whatever. But also, um, this second stage, uh, the, the classification model, in some sense, in some sense it, it acquires a fundamental knowledge about, about the human eye anatomy. Uh, because uh, the, the input is, is totally independent on, on the device in which it was acquired from. And that, that allows us also to, um, to incorporate easily scans that, are, that have been taken from a different scanning device. So actually, uh, if we, we get a new set, of, new, new set of scans from a different device, we only, had to, we only we have to train the, um, this uh, segmentation network by still keeping the, the original classification network uh, fixed. So, Basically, we only need to have a hundred and a few hundred uh, labels uh, for the for the first stage, and then we are done. Actually, I'll talk a bit about that uh, later. And yeah, we do all this while keeping uh, expert performance, which is what we wanted at the end. So um, again, uh, for the first stage, we use a pretty similar network as what we were using before, a unit. Again, the input is. Uh, yeah, it's a patch in three dimensions. Now we have only nine slices uh, in the input and one in the output. 
but yeah, it's other than this, it's, it's pretty similar to the one before. And and these are this is an example of the results. So as I said, we have five of those. We have an ensemble of those. So we have several. In particular, we have five. So for the same input, we have uh, five different outputs. So they, this is also nice because we can see uh, the uncertainty or some sort of the ambiguity between uh, in the input. Like for example, it's pretty clear that these uh, boxes are classified as as these layers, but in the center, it's not that clear. So there's more uncertainty. And that one thing that we have seen is that um, when when a model seems to be or when an ensemble seems to be uncertain about some regions. We see that when, when we ask uh, several um, doctors to label the same region, they also disagree in about the same parts, which is what we see here. This is the, uh, the, res the output of our models, uh, and this is the, the predictions by different experts. So we see that there is quite a lot of variety, and, and that the, the ensemble is able to, to cover some part of this variety that the experts uh, have. Which is, which is, a, is, a, is a nice thing. Okay, so about the second stage of the, of the pipeline is just a classification network, which takes as an input uh, the segmentation. In this case, it has been uh, downsampled uh, a bit. And yeah, this, each block is basically a dense block. And, and at the end, yeah, we get just the, the predictions. So each block is a dense block, and by that I mean uh, something like this, in which you have a sequence of convolutions, and then the, the output of the convolution is that is concatenated to the input and, and passed through the next convolution. So it's pretty simple. Um, yeah, so we had uh, uh, an ensemble of segmenta segmentation models, five of them, and also another, another um, ensemble of classification models, again, five of them. So uh, in total, we, we have five and five 25 predictions that we can use to, uh, we can average or we can do all sorts of things to get a final prediction. And also this is a good, again, to get a measure or an estimation of the uncertainty of, of, the, of the model. So how well does it work? So in this case, um, what I'm showing here is, is a rock curve of uh, heat, uh, yeah, heat rate versus false alarm. Um, and, and this is for the, for the top class, for the, for the agent referral class, which is the most important. Uh, so we can see here that the, the, the rock curve is, looks pretty nice. It's almost perfect. Actually, the, the area is 99.21%. Uh, but how well is actually this doing? So in order to compare, in order to have a real estimation, we compare it with, with actual experts, doctors. And that's what they, that, that's what they, where they, um, uh, are, uh, what they perform. So we can see that when, they, when the doctors uh, classify an, an OCT scan, they are worse, and actually significantly worse than our model, except for the, the top two guys, which are experts that have more than 20 years of, of, of experience. So this, this looks uh, pretty nice, it uh, looks great, but uh, I could stop uh, talking here, but on the other hand, uh, this is a bit of, uh, this is not completely fair, to be honest. And the reason is because the experts, the doctors, the uh, ophthalmologists, uh, they usually have e some extra information. They normally have uh, uh, extra information, such as um, the fundus image, which is uh, like a, this, this sort of picture that can, where you can appreciate the vessels and, and also all sort of things, plus also some extra information like the age, gender, and, and so on. So then we decide to asking the doctors to, to see how they perform when they have access to this, to this information. So this is before, without, and then this is after they are presented with the information. They, they improve quite a bit. Uh, now still we see that um, some doctors perform um, pretty well and in a way better than, than our model, but still they don't perform significantly better because the, the significant area is, is the great one. Uh, still, we can see that uh, our model performs significantly better than these three guys, which are experts of up to nine years of experience, even when our model only look at only sees the the OCD. So yeah, that looks um, good. 
and now here we explore uh, how well the uh, models, per, uh, or how, how is the comparison when we take all the four classes into account. So here uh, it is about the misclassification error. So our model does, uh, has a 5.5% of error, and the experts uh, have also, well, you can see, is, uh, we are better than the, doc the doctors when they only look at the OCT, and we are the same le at the same level of the best doctor when they also have access to the other information. Yeah? Uh, usually, yes. Actually, uh, that's a good question. I think, again, I have put the slide at the end of, of my <laughs> deck about this. So we have plotted, um, well, well, we have um, so shown the, the confusion matrices of, of different experts and uh, of our model. Usually, uh, at least in terms of confusion matrices, we see uh, that they look quite similar. One thing uh, that I think we have reported is, is uh, scan wise, like uh, scan by scan, looking at the uh, yeah, how, how different doctors perform on, on the model. Um, I'm not sure about that, but yeah, that's, that's something that would be definitely interesting because one one issue is uh, one issue that we really want to to make sure is that the model doesn't make silly mistakes that that are easily spotted by by an expert. So yeah, but in, in principle, it, it looks like um, like it, it does. Uh, perform similarly to, to experts. Uh, I might have missed it, but did you say how do you define urgency here? Uh, urgency is, is a label that the doctors... Um, oh, yeah, true. The, the, how, how the ground truth is... Um, yeah, again, this is in a, in a slide at the end. That's is it that way? So, so briefly speaking, um, so the ground truth um, label is is um, given by doctors or after the, um, they have access to all the um, the period uh, like uh, uh, these scans are, are uh, I don't know a few years ago uh, a few years old and the, and for in order to get the ground truth the, the doctors have access to the uh, sequence of uh, future um, uh, visits or. So basically, with all this, together with, uh, with the extra information that they also have, that's the ground truth. So basically, it's, it's more accurate than the, the, the experts. Here. So the experts, uh, when, when we compare the experts here, uh, what they have access to is to the current yeah. OCD scan so without, without, a floor, without the future uh, information. So only OCD scan and um, the, the other yeah, the fundus and the other information. That's a good question. I'm not sure I can tell you for sure, but this is uh, several experts uh, agreeing on having the whole history, whether this is the whole, the complete truth, I don't know. Uh, but I guess it's the best we can get in this problem. But yeah, uh, yeah. So that's here. And yeah, that is briefly speaking about the, um, uh, what I told about before on having different uh, scanning devices, how our approach can deal with it, uh, framework. So in our in the experiments that I've shown before, we have been using this kind of scan, the Topcom, uh, and then um, after that we got a new set of um, scans from this different uh, scanning device. So. When we, when we use the scans that we get from here into our pipeline that was trained only on that, we get something like this, which, is that, which doesn't make sense. So it's a constellation of tissues that are meaningless. And of course, if we put this as an input of the classification network, we get something, very, very bad uh, classification errors. Um, so what we did is to, um, retrain the, uh, the segmentation network uh, by having only 150 uh, segmentation slices, labels, um, on, on the new scans. And, uh, and then, yeah, we get uh, much better segmentations. And then finally, the classification uh, network was, uh, the, the final results were also pretty good. 
like in the same range of, of the ones that we were we were getting before. Yeah. So this was you took the network which was trained on the old system and then you did incremental learning with the small subset. Not exactly, uh, but is so what we did is uh, and again <laughs> this is in the slide at the end. Um, is it not a way to? Uh, well, anyway, I can explain it with words. So it's uh, uh, what we did is um, to, to train a network from scratch, but uh, we're using all the images uh, from both the previous scan and the new scan. But uh, we had different uh, two different pipelines. So the first block was actually two blocks, and, and the the input uh, if if it belonged to one scan it, uh, to the first scan it would go f through the first uh, block for the, yeah, the first branch of the block. If it belonged to the second, the second device, it would go through, through the second uh, branch of the block. I can show you later the, 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 the picture, but, but it's, it's basically, yeah. We will have done that too. Uh, so yeah. Why did you do that instead of just fine tuning the original? Yeah, so uh, actually we, we did try uh, fine tuning, but, the main, but it, it didn't work as well. But also the main reason is that here, the, um, the main differences that we see between, between different scans is usually the, the texture and kind of uh, um, like small artifacts and, and differences in the texture. So it's sort of um, differences that, that we thought that are um, learned in the, in the first part of the network, in the first block. And uh, fine tuning uh, usually is good when, when you do in the in the Second, well, in the, in the end of by the end of the network, so by doing it this way, it, it did get quite good results, like like the ones we see here. So it, at the end, that 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 was the the option that was the the best for us. But yeah, that that, that could be uh, that, that's definitely something we consider. Um, okay, so I think I'm almost done with the second one. Um, yeah. No diagnosis, uh, labels, yeah, that's something to, so of course we didn't do anything here, we fixed the, the classification uh, network. Um, so yeah, conclusions about this project, uh, we get uh, expert performance on referral decision, and, and we did so by using the, the two-stage architecture, uh, that, that allows us to have the clinical, clinically interpretable um, uh, representations of the, of the of the input and the, and the decision made by the, by the network. And also it allows or it makes uh, the classification network to have this universal knowledge that in turn allows us to, uh, to have a simple adaptation uh, of our model to new scanning devices. Um, also uh, having ensembles in both uh, the segmentation stage and the classification stage allows us to have some measure of uncertainties of uh, yeah, uh, of how uncertain is the model with respect to the predictions, um, and yeah, and you can also uh, read. Uh, you can have more details by going to the article. Uh, yeah. So uh, my first question is: it trained uh, separately the first part? The yeah. Uh, we did, uh, but there were there were a lot of issues. Uh, at the end, uh, we decided to to keep things simple. Um, yeah, th 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 there are several things. Like if if you train everything end to end, um, and if you don't pay extra care, um, what may happen is that. Um, so if you um, have, as an input of this network, you have the, the probability uh, pixel-wise of, of, uh, of this instead of, instead of just the labels, uh, maybe by training end to end, you may, uh, the, the network somehow is able to learn how to encode extra information that is not in the labels in the probabilities. We saw that that might happen, but also technically, it was also quite difficult to fit everything into memory. We did uh, um, some efforts in that direction, but uh, yeah, at the end we decided to, to just keep th things simple for, for now at least and uh, have this uh, working and then we can see if we can make something like this. So then in that sense, I guess you didn't have the baseline of just removing the signal in the middle? Or 
just having the same architecture and then no semantic set semantic layer? Oh, uh, we did try directly to, um, to have a network that goes from here to there. But not the same architecture? Though. Not the same, yeah. Well, what we did is something quite similar to, to this one, but directly having the, um, the OCD here. We also added a, a bit more layers here just to compensate and also to allow to have as much as, well, quite close to what the memory allowed. Um, it, the results were pretty similar, actually slightly better, but not significantly better than the ones that we're reporting here. But, but uh, here we have these extra advantages. But yeah, that's. Memory is a big issue, basically. Yeah. yeah. It is, it is. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, mostly when it comes to classify big volumes. Uh, yeah. A technical question. What, what kind of GPUs were you using? Mm, we were, to be honest, I don't know the, the, the model. Uh, but I think they had uh, 16 or 12 of, or 16 gigabytes of memory. Okay. I think it was 16. But yeah, I'm not sure. But yeah. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much this part, uh, uh, this project. If you have any other question about this one. So uh, one thing about talking about this project is, is about uncertainty. So um, and this is what the next project is, is about, is, is to, uh, to be able to deal with this uncertainty. Like, uh, Basically, uh, you can see here, uh, this is a different data set, but we have seen that this happens in many different data sets uh, on, on, uh, on body scans, that different doctors label or segment the same thing in different ways. So this data set here is on lung cancer, on well, lung, uh, lung CD scans. These are patches that might contain uh, a lesion and these are for experts uh, segmenting the lesion uh, if they consider that there is any lesion there. So we can see here that um, they are, um, well, they, 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 there are some uh, variability. Uh, in the shape here, there's definitely quite different shapes. And even, even whether there is a lesion or not, for example, this expert here considered that there was no lesion uh, or, or down there. So there is quite a lot of uh, variability. So the main, uh, and we see also before in the previous project we were using ensembles and to some extent they were useful to account for this. Uh, but we want to, to he here to properly study how to, to account for this, how to make a model that is able to, um, yeah, to, to map from, from the input image to uh, a distribution of uh, segmentations that are plausible given the input. So this is what, what we get uh, with the solution that we propose here. Just to give you a brief overview is uh, getting the best of the segmentation work, which is the unit that I mentioned before, and the probabilistic uh, side, which is we use a, this conditional variational autoencoder. Um, so why, why is this useful in the first place? So why do we want to, to model this uh, uncertainty? So there are, there are several, several use cases, but one, one is that uh, having several hypotheses for the same input is useful because it could be propagated to the next, the next uh, uh, steps in the pipeline. And these steps could be doctors themselves or other models. Like, in the, for example, in the previous uh, project, we had the second uh, stage. So you can propagate different hypotheses to the second stage and have different predictions. Also, uh, it could be useful for those cases in which uh, the clinician has to modify segmentation. So it can just pick the best hypothesis and, and adjust if necessary. But more generally, having several hypotheses can guide the way we solve the ambiguities by requesting specific data to, to solve them. So um, the model that we use is something like this. Well, it starts, uh, the, the, the starting point is something like this. So it's, it's a unit uh, like the one that I saw before. Uh, this is smaller, but the idea is the same. Um, and it's also for. Uh, for uh, illustration purposes. So right now we have an image, and then we just map it to a segmentation deterministically. Now, what we are actually interested in is to, to model the, the space of, of potential uh, plausible segmentations given input and have uh, a distribution on, on that where we can sample from uh, possible segmentations. So that's what we do here. 
So on top, uh, in addition to have a, a unit, we also have another uh, network, uh, we call it prior net, um, which basically induces uh, a distribution, uh, we fix it to be, to be a Gaussian distribution over this uh, latent space that encode, uh, that encode uh, all possible segmentations. So um, from here we can sample from, uh, from, this, from this space and then we concatenate the output into the, into the unit and then finally we produce uh, different segmentations. So for example, for, for this set one, we get this segmentation, then we get another sample from the latent space, uh, concatenated to the unit, and then we get a different segmentation, and so on. So when, when we have chosen a point in the, in the latent space, like the one we see here, when we choose a point, then there is a de deterministic mapping to the, to the segmentation. So that's the main, that's the main uh, thing. Um, just to, to give you an overview about how this is trained. Um, by the way, may I ask you, uh, are you um, familiar with the auto uh, variational autoencoders in general? So this is, uh, okay, I, I'll briefly explain it, uh, just, just quickly. Uh, so this is just a standard, non-conditional, just standard variational autoencoder. Uh, in this case, if we want to model the distribution of uh, ground, of it, usually this is done on images, but you can also model the distribution of all the segmentations that are uh, uh, plausible. So what you do is uh, you take it into this uh, encoder or posterior net, uh, you induce a, a distribution uh, from where you sample, uh, same as before, you sample and then you reconstruct uh, the, the segmentation um, using the decoder. And then you minimize some loss between the, the reconstruction and the original and the original image or segmentation. But uh, on top of that, we want on expectation we want um, that the distribution that, that you get here is as is as close as possible to the prior that in this case we define we define it to be a standard Gaussian, and we make this so by also minimizing the KL divergence. So in our case, we also have um, we, we have context, not only the segmentation, but we also have uh, the inputs. So we have we introduce uh, this context, this image, into both the posterior net, the encoder, and also the prior. So we make the prior not fixed anymore, but instead it is, it is a function of of the of the input image. Um, and then, same as before, we uh, we minimize the um, in this case the cross entropy between the prediction, the predictive segmentation and the ground truth, as well as the KL divergence between the the prior and the posterior. So, yeah. Prior output is again a normal distribution, but just not a standard model, right? Which one? Sorry. Uh, the prior. Exactly. So, so the prior, the prior net, um, uh, gi given uh, an image, it produces as an output the the mean and the standard the diagonal uh, uh, yeah, standard um, uh, deviation, and then yeah, that, that's the induced distribution where we sample from from it. Uh, well, yeah, we can directly uh, compute the KL divergence between these, well, any two Gaussians. In this case, the Gaussian induced by the prior and the Gaussian induced by the posterior. So basically, this one is the same as before, but now it's not, it's not fixed. It's, it's a function of the input. So it's the mean of the mean. It's, sorry? It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, that mean that comes out is the distribution no, over the, the mean. No, no, this is the, so uh, basically this, um, the, the point of this network is to map the, the image to a Gaussian over this latent space. So basically, the output of the of this of this uh, network is is just the, the parameters of, of that Gaussian, which is the mean and the and the so coordinates. It used to be zero and one. It used to be zero. Yes. Yeah, but exactly. How do, you, why do you sample from that? Then? How do we sample? Yeah, why do you sample? Uh, I heard that you sample. That, that, that one is the one that we So yeah, well, okay, yeah, we sample at three. Yeah, we sample at uh, three in time. We sample from the posterior. Only from Sorry. The yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I made a mistake. At, at inference time, we do. Uh, at, sorry, at, at, okay. at test time, we do sample from from the prior because that's the only thing we have. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Then, uh, do you train this? Uh, 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 do you train this at the same time? The uh, learn 
Yeah. yeah. No, no. A everything is trained uh, end to end simultaneously. It's it's just um, so in the same way uh, if you if you fix the prior, yeah. uh, there, there's I guess there's no problem. Yeah. Okay. So so you, you just uh, um, just the same thing actually. So it, at the beginning uh, both um, uh, yeah distributions might be very far away, but by just m minimizing the KL together with the, so the KL uh, uh, makes makes you learn both the posterior and the prior uh, simultaneously. If you fix one, well, uh, it's prior because it's not it's not dependent on the ground truth. So yeah, it's well, for the, for the conditional. yeah, the, the prior is only depending on the on the condition, yeah, on the image. Okay, that makes sense. I see. Sorry, I thought you have both. No, no. Okay, so, so yeah, the difference between the previous slide is now you have I, you have the. The, the image, the context uh, in both, yeah, okay. posterior and prior. Um, yeah, so that that's the yeah that's that's the whole story actually about how the model is is trained. Um, so there is of course all other uh, work that is related and that can be applied to the same problem. So there is uh, some work on that account uh, or tries to. Um, to account for how uh, to, to about the uncertainty pixel-wise of, of segmentations, which is the first one. And, uh, the second one is on having several hypotheses given the same input. I will talk a bit more about them in the next slide. And then the, the last one, for example, this is on this is not specifically. It wasn't applied specifically to segmentation, uh, or, or let's say segmentation was only a, one application of those. So yeah. Uh, I, I can't see a way to backpropagate through KL diversions. Like, how do you uh, so, uh, both from the for the posterior and, and for the prior net, we need to use the um, reparameterization trick. Yeah, so, but is I'm not sure if that answers your question. But it's, uh, for the reparameterization trick to work in the latent space in the posterior and the variational time order, sure. Like, Oh, oh, I see, I see. True. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, so the, the, the prior, um, so the KL division between two Gaussians is, uh, has a closed form. So, so you can just directly minimize that. And that's, that's how. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the, last, the last alternative is, is uh, this um, translation. Is there any question? We haven't tried that. Yeah, um, yeah, it could be. So, uh, are you s saying that? So, wh why would that be? So, I'm guessing like if there would be, say, for instance, uh, there's two subcomponents of the doctor segmentating in different ways, and mm -hmm. you want to fit right. like nuts. Um, I mean, like maybe you want to get this the other yeah. subpopulation segmentation. Like yeah. Yeah, so to which extent doctors are conditioned to a prior? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. No, no, we haven't done it, but, but it, could, it could be. So actually, for, for this period, by the way, we, we've been uh, using public data. We haven't, the, all the segmentations here, everything, we don't have access to the doctors. Actually, we don't even have access to the identity of the doctor. So when I said before, uh, when I presented here, this thing, uh, actually columns doesn't necessarily uh, they, they, they are not. Uh, this is not the same doctor. So we only have four doctors. Actually, in total, I think there was a pool of twelve doctors, and they were assigned to to the scans. But yeah, that could be actually yeah something interesting. Um, yeah. So just going directly to the baselines. 
uh, that we have used to compare uh, our model. So one uh, baseline is just using dropout, both at training at, at, and also at test time. So at test time, we have different uh, dropout patterns, so you get different outputs. Um, we also try with an ensemble, same as before in the, uh, in the IE scan project. Uh, we have these M heads. So M heads, it's uh, basically you have a, a unit, but uh, you, uh, in the last, uh, at the end of it, you have several heads, you have several outputs. And the point is that uh, at training time, you, you um, compute all the outputs, and then you compare them to the ground truth, and then you back propagate only uh, through, the, through, through the head that gets closest, the closest to the, to the ground truth. Uh, so in that way, different heads learn different modalities of the data. I in practice, what they do is to, to also back propagate uh, the gradient through all uh, heads, but times small constant. So the, the point is to, to avoid uh, having heads uh, dying in a starvation, so, so to speak. So, th so the point is to use all heads. And yeah, finally, this image to image. Uh, Operational uh, of encoder, which is uh, conceptually is, uh, is probably the closest to, to ours, but there are uh, several differences. Probably the most important difference is that the, they don't condition the prior on the on the image, um, so the prior is not a function of the image, and the posterior, uh, the encoder, is not a function of um, of the image either. Um, so yeah. Mm. So, so just in each, of each member of the ensemble not just give you a point system, but also a variance, and then you combine these in, in a Right. No, here each model only uh, produces a, a point, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, we can then submit uh, variance over those points, but not, but not per model, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the data set we've been using for the first uh, experiment. Um, so in this case, yeah, we have 1,000 uh, CD scans, about 1,000. Uh, but what we did is to uh, crop uh, those regions where at least one of the experts thinks that, that there is uh, a lesion. So in total, uh, by doing that, we get uh, almost 9,000 images for, uh, for a drain set and 2,000 for the validation and another 2,000 for a test set. So that's what I said before. And yeah, the size is 120 by 128. They are pretty small. Uh, this is the slide that I mentioned bef that I saw before. So yeah, this is just some uh, showing uh, some, up, some samples that we get uh, with our model. Um, and one nice thing about the, our, our approach is that uh, given that we have the, the posterior, we can estimate how surprised the model is when you provide the ground, the ground truth. So for example, when you give the image and, and, this, um, and this segmentation, it, it, it's, it's in this region of the latent space, which is far from, it's two standard divisions away from the, from the mean. So that means that this is quite unexpected. While, for example, uh, number three uh, is, is quite, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite what the model was expecting because it's very close to the mean. Um, so these are some qualitative uh, base, uh, baseline, the results. Um, so this is dropout. Dropout, uh, the dropout unit is, is pretty good at estimating pixel-wise uncertainties, but it's not that good when it comes to, to produce consistent outputs. So that's why you see these sort of salt and pepper uh, predictions or samples. Um, image to image VAE, uh, yeah, there's some, um, uh, some uh, uh, variety, but we saw that a lot of, a lot of, the, of the samples are, are empty. Um, the unit ensemble, we see here that there is a bit of variation, but usually what you get uh, in, from different models are, are, is quite similar, which is also sort of expected. And then M heads, there is some variation there, uh, but still you are limited to the number of heads. So yeah, it's, it's not quite uh, what we want. And then yeah, these are some samples of our model. So this is qualitatively, but in terms of quantitatively, which is what we want to know, how well our model performs. So for this, we use as a metric the uh, generalized energy distance, which is basically 
Um, so you have samples from the, your uh, predictions and samples from the ground truth distribution. And what you do is to uh, take into account the distance between every uh, pair of uh, points with samples from the, the uh, uh, ground truth distribution and your distribution. And then you discount the distances between points of the same distribution. So you discount the variance, basically. And this D, uh, the, the way to compare two segmentations, uh, we use one minus the intersection of a union. So just briefly speaking, because we should finish soon, these are the results. Uh, so basically, we can get as, as many samples as we want. So these are the results uh, when you get 4, 8, and 16 samples. Um, and our model is, oops, our model is the green one, the triangle, which is the one that gets the best results, which is, which is nice. Um, and briefly speaking, just uh, we have a bit of time. Uh, this is a, we did a second experiment. In this case, we used uh, uh, these cityscapes images, images from streets that are also segmented. Uh, there are there's not much uncertainty here. So what we did was to artificially add uncertainty and. The, the, we did that because uh, because of two reasons. One is to to um, do experiments on more challenging uh, images, but also uh, because by adding the uncertainty, we can control exactly what the ground truth distribution is. So in particular, what we, what we did here is to create this uh, set of uh, synonym classes. So basically, we swap with this probability from sidewalk to the class sidewalk two and so on. So with this probability, we swap from person to person two, and so on. So given that we have five classes that we might swap, we have in total two to the five, 32 possible uh, segmentations given the same input. So this is a, a visualization of the latent space learned by our model. So you might see the numbers there. Each of them corresponds to each of those 32 potential, potential uh, segmentations. And so you can see they are close to the center, which is what we expect. Uh, this is again same as before. Um, so again, we get the best uh, results compared to the others. But also another nice thing is that given that we control or we, we have total knowledge about the uncertainty distribution, we can see how well our model uh, is calibrated with respect to the probabilities of each of the modes, each of the segmentations. So as I said, there are 32 possible segmentations. And these are uh, 32 columns. So the field, uh, the field columns represent the ground truth probability for each mode. And then the green uh, represents the frequency uh, that each model, in this case the dropout model, uh, um, got that particular mode. So you can see here that the model is only able to cover a few modes, and they are completely uncalibrated. Um, on the other hand, is this model does pretty good in, in pixel-wise estimation, which is also, uh, I think, the, their main motivation. So in our case, uh, we get much better uh, calibration uh, mode-wise. So all modes are covered and, and sort of having a similar uh, distribution. Uh, and yeah, we did that with all models. So these are the five models here. So this is, again, the same thing, but uh, a bit more synthesized. Uh, we have, again, five, uh, sorry, 32 points per model. Uh, and basically, the, the x-axis is the, the, the probability of the, the ground truth probability for each mode, and the y-axis is the frequency estimated by the well, the, the probability estimated by the model. And in general, you see that our model is the one that gets the closest to the to the identity line, which is uh, the best that that, we, that you can hope for. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the end. Uh, just to finish with some conclusions about this project. We have uh, this approach that, le that learns a conditional probability over segmentation maps. Uh, it's able to provide uh, an unlimited number of samples, as many as you want. Uh, it's also, by the way, very efficient when it comes to sampling, because you only have to recalculate the last part of the, of the, of the model. You need to recompute the whole ac all the activations in the, in the unit. Uh, there's no need to adjust for number of modes. And yeah, this could be used also, uh, this application could be used as another way to um, evaluate generative, conditional generative models. Uh, source code uh, is available there. Um, and yeah, more details in the, in the paper. And yeah, this is some, uh, all the people that were somehow involved in all, the, all of the projects. Uh, 
So yeah, thank to them, and, and of course, uh, thank to you for your attention. And I'm happy to answer questions if they have time. <laughs>